Hi there, this is your host Robin Norgren and this podcast is called Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I'd like to begin with some thoughts from Eugene Peterson. I'm going to first read um, Galatians 2, 19 and 20 out of the New Living Translation. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a, quote, law man, unquote, so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. The writer of these words, Paul, knows a thing or two about trying to keep rules to please God. He was from a group called the Pharisees in the Bible, which were um, the utmost in the society of being able to keep all the laws of God. And he was finding that he was doing those things and yet not feeling close to God. While we may not have the same forms of obviously self-righteous behavior in our culture, There is still a very human tendency to try to create our own righteousness with good behavior. What are the rules that you try to keep to please God or make yourself look righteous in the company of others? What motivates such rule keeping in your life? Why is it easier to have a checklist of good and bad behaviors than to identify completely with Christ? Confess to God the rules you've been holding on to. Honestly, search your heart and ask the Spirit to reveal your motivations and even your most Christian behavior. Thank and praise God for the gift of Jesus Christ, who has freed you from the burden of achieving righteousness on your own. Ask God for help viewing your life as no longer belonging to you, but instead the property of Jesus Christ. Ask for fear to be cast out and for a sense of peace in God's salvation over and beyond anything your efforts could achieve to flood over you. The life you are living today is no longer your own. Christ lives in you and his righteousness is what gives you confidence. Set aside your own confidence and live by faith in the Son of God alone. This segment is from a book called Crushing by T.D. Jakes. I notice we're focused on making wine from our crushing. But allow me to borrow a term from another phenomenon that affects an equally destabilizing change. I have never experienced an earthquake in the full force of its immediacy. But I have visited many locales where the shifting of tectonic plates below the Earth's surface resulted in a cataclysmic readjustment, often at the expense of lost lives and pulverized homes and businesses. Scientists use the term aftershock to describe the ongoing tremors occurring as a result of the initial quake. Sometimes the aftershock can seem just as damaging, if not more so, as the primary shift. As we consider the way crushing levels us, with what we may feel like a quake deep within our souls. I believe the word aftershock aptly describes our emotional state after experiencing the trauma of being crushed. Like the earth experiences smaller quakes after the primary convulsion, 
we often find ourselves being riddled with the emotional disturbances that come from being reminded of what we've just endured. Unfortunately, because our mental states have yet to settle, the slightest rattle sends us into some sort of mental over-responsiveness that makes us brace for something else just as terrible as the initial jolt. It's quite similar to post-traumatic stress disorder and leaves us reeling in the wake of our crushing, wondering when the next blow will bruise us. We struggle to hope as we brace for what we expect to be the next infliction of pain upon our psyche. We're sensitive and scared, anxious about what else might befall us. Just like in our pruning stage, we grapple with normal, knowing that you will never be the same and nothing will ever see normal again. And so what should you do with yourself? When it comes to winemaking, the fermentation stage is nothing more than a waiting area for the grapes. They have already been crushed, and now the grapes find themselves in an aspect of the process where there is no pain, so to speak. It's a holding pattern, just like when you see a plane waiting for the weather to clear so it can take off or for the runway to be made ready for the plane to land. Some holding patterns can last a matter of minutes, while others could be hours. It's a continuous circling before settling or stirring around and around in the same vat while nothing seems to be happening. This is precisely how one feels in the transition phases of life. They're tempted to say there isn't much taking place, but they fail to realize that their movement has progressed. They might find themselves in a holding pattern, but fail to understand that their flight has been moved from 40th in line to second. This is because transition doesn't feel like work. It often feels like waiting, like climbing a set of steps in a stairwell and finding yourself stuck as one foot hovers above the next step. You're in the position of being able to move up and forward but finding that there's something else to be done before you are fully prepared to complete your climb. It's in that transitory moment of waiting that God is preparing you for the next step. Just like the holding pattern, the true work is hidden. A plane's pilot, not fully knowing what's going on on the ground, can only be patient while those in the air traffic control tower work out all the details. Otherwise, the plane might descend before the pilot has been given permission and slam into another jet that is taken off. Destruction comes swiftly on the heels of moving too soon. So after crushing us, God exercises his grace by allowing us to ferment in the supposed stillness of transition so that we might be ready for the next stage. Thirst by Mary Oliver Another morning and I wake with thirst For the goodness I do not have I walk out to the pond And all the way God has given us Such beautiful lessons O Lord, I was never a quick scholar But sulked and hunched over my books Past the hour and the bell Grant me in your mercy a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent. Yet already I have given a great many things away, expecting to be told to pack nothing except the prayers which with this thirst I am slowly learning.